good morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, last time that I preached, we, I read from 1 Corinthians 15, and we read all 58 verses. So this morning, I thought I would preach on Psalm 119, and we're going to read all 176 of them, and we're going to do it while standing. No, we're not. We're not. I was between that and Jesus wept, and uh, I, I did neither, but I uh, just figured I'd keep you on your toes this morning. Now today, we are going to be reading from James 3. I began studying uh, the book of James about a, a month or so ago. Um, it had been a while since I had done it, so I felt like I needed a good kick in the pants. Um, so I decided to sit down and read through it and get a good word study on it, take it uh, in small bits um, every single day, and uh, it sufficiently been kicked in the pants. And uh, I decided that we were going to be reading from James 3. Uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of the book of James, uh, it's written by the brother of Jesus to the, to the 12 dispersed tribes of Jerusalem. Uh, you'll notice if you read it, there are a lot of similarities between it and the book of Proverbs gives little vignettes of how we as believers should live in light of the truth. So chapter 1, he says, Count it all joy when you go through trials. Uh, remain steadfast in your sufferings. Don't just hear the word, but do the word. Chapter 2 says, Don't show partiality. Uh, for instance, the rich versus the poor. Uh, faith without works is dead. Now just to be clear, this is not saying that we are saved by our works. We are saved by grace through faith, but the saving grace should be evident by the things that we do and the way that we carry ourselves and the words that we say. So that leads us here to chapter 3, taming tongue, taming the tongue. Now before we go any further, let's, let's think about the tongue. The tongue uh, is a very uh, powerful object in the body. Um, it is very small comparatively, right? It holds a lot of weight. The words that we say matter. It's uh, clearly evident in not just scripture but in pop culture that the tongue or the words that we say uh, hold power. We often try and downplay it and say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That, that's a lie. Um, I, even as a, as a grown man at this point, when I was young, um, I was climbing up the slide, and uh, I was in uh, kindergarten or first grade, and a kid grabbed me by my ankles and pulled them out from under me, and my face hit the slide. Uh, I don't recommend climbing up the slide, mom told me, but, you know, I was safe as long as someone wasn't trying to trip me. But either way, I hit these two front teeth, and it discolored them. And I'll tell you what, kids have this unbelievable ability to look at you and say, I'm going to pinpoint that insecurity right there, and I'm just going to ask you about that one. And so kids would go, come up to me, and they would look and say, your teeth are dirty. And I knew that they weren't, but it, was, you know, it makes you feel self-conscious. I'm sure that you also can think of something that people have said that is obviously much worse than just <laughs> you should brush your teeth because you know, they're probably right anyway. Um, but I'm sure that you can think of some things as well that, that have, have gone into your mind and gone into your heart and you just have not been able to escape. Indeed, we know that the words that we say hold weight. Because of the adages like, the pen is mightier than the sword. This is referring to war and using words instead of weapons. Uh, it says that words hold more weight than violence and proving a point. If you go to the Revolutionary War, the printing press being active and people like Thomas Paine writing common sense was very helpful in uniting the colonies to ensure that no one would side with the crown if war was to ensue. And then people try to limit our speech. Because they know that with the right words, uh, it can rally people to a specific cause and make change in culture, make change in people's lives. And this is just shows how effective our words are. And 
finally, one of the most important views on just how weighty our words are, how much they matter. We have that example from our Father in heaven in Genesis when it says God spoke and there was. God spoke and there was light. God spoke and there was everything that we say, see today created. So, that brings us to where we are in chapter 3. Now, there are three things that James makes very clear. One, the tongue is small, but the tongue is powerful. Two, the tongue cannot be tamed by human will. Cannot be tamed by human will. We'll, we'll get more into that soon. And three, the use of our tongues is telling about the nature of our hearts. In these points, James wants us, the readers, to realize that the tongue is very powerful. He essentially echoes what Solomon says, which if he's writing to the, the Jews, they would very much so understand this, what Solomon says in Proverbs 18 when he says, the power of death and life are in the tongue. It clearly has the power to not just ruin our reputation or our relationships, but also our spiritual well-being. Let me get a sip of water here, and then we're going to read James 3, 2 through 12. If you would like to turn there, I'll give you just a second. James 3, 2 through 12. I understand why Pastor Mark likes to have that little... Uh, Thing there, you have to, that's a long way down. James 3, 2 through 12. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also, though they are large, and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Verse 5, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course. Of life and set on fire by hell. Verse 7 For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for its sufficiency, for, uh, for examining our hearts, Lord. I pray this morning in light of it that we look into ourselves, that we look and see where things might be in our heart that we need to give to you. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, as, as we go through this passage, as uh, we bring your word that you uh, give us ears to hear and hearts to listen and understand. Lord, I pray that everything that is said this morning, everything that is heard this morning is from you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're going to start in verse 3. We're going to start in verse 3. And what I love about James is he uses very simple language here. He uses things that can help us better understand uh, just how powerful the tongue is. 
Uh, so let's look at what he says. Verse 3, he says, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. So let's look at how large that animal is. There's a picture, it should be, of a Clydesdale. This is a very large horse. Uh, from hoof to shoulder, it, stands, it can stand up to six feet tall. It can weigh as much as 2,200 pounds. Yet humans have been able to utilize these beasts for thousands of years, using them to ride, to get from one place to another, to pull carts, and we command them with this bit. This can be held in the hands of a man. Look at the size difference. A horse that can be 2,000 pounds heavier than an average male bends at the mercy of this small piece of equipment. So as we pull to the left with the reins, the horse naturally goes left. And as we pull to the right, he goes right. Pull back, he stops, or at least you hope so. James gives plenty of clarity on how something so large is controlled by something that is so small. And at this point, we could stop because we get a general understanding of what he's saying. But he goes even further. He says, ships, look at the ships also. They are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Now, this ship that is up here is uh, the largest, at this, at this point, I think, the largest container ship that had ever been constructed. Uh, it is incredibly large and is powered by a turn of this rudder. Now, obviously, that is still very large. Right, But in comparison to the rest of the ship, I think it only makes up about 2% two, two of the ship. If you show that next slide, it shows a diagram. It should still be up there. There it is. So that massive ship is piloted by that small rudder. Now what happens if either of these things are out of control? The, the, the entire subject is out of control. The horses can't be turned as it continues to run wild. The ship will continue to drift aimlessly into sea. So in order to make sure that these things are working properly, they must be inspected and they must be managed regularly. So must our tongues. Like the ship with a broken rudder or the horse without a bit, if our tongue is not in control, then we are not in control. We are like wild men walking through life aimlessly, with no real direction, speaking indiscriminately, wreaking havoc everywhere we go, tearing down those around us, slandering our brothers and sisters. So we move on to verse 6. He says, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So he is, he is equating the words that we say to fire. Now we have all grown up hearing the lessons of Smokey the Bear, right? We have, we've seen what the smallest of embers can do. And what does Smokey the Bear say? Only you can prevent forest fires. Um, I have also seen in our own backyard the power of what an ember can do. <laughs> My grandfather one time, a lot, this was a long time ago, he, he still uh, says he didn't do it, but we're pretty sure he did. He, he smoked, and uh, he had put out a cigarette, and uh, one of those small embers caught our entire backyard on fire. And he was like, I don't know what happened. I was like, well, we don't smoke. I'm 13. <laughs> but thankfully, this wasn't as bad as it could have been. But more seriously, recently, we have seen some of the worst fires of the last 50 years happen across much of the West. We've seen the destruction that it has caused, destroying homes, businesses, and farms, oftentimes lives. The ability to contain this destruction does seem far off. And this is what James is saying that our unbridled tongue does. It stains the body. It sets the entire course of life ablaze. And this is everything, the entire course of life. That is not just our current physical life, but again, our spiritual life. James is very careful to let us know where this fire comes from. This is not just some random arbitrary fire. This is fire from hell. So we've now been presented with the fact that the tongue, while small, has a power to control us, and then we are presented with the fact that while out of control, our tongue sets our entire lives ablaze, so how do we control it? This is where the similarities between 
the fire of our tongues produces and the embers that start a forest fire, James gives a very different message than Smokey the Bear because we are not the ones who can prevent this forest fire. He goes on to verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. So to understand this, let's, let's, let's go to the beginning again. God has given us dominion over the earth and the garden. He said, let us make mankind in our image, our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock. Let they rule over them. And this is clearly seen in creation. We have trained dogs to sit, to roll over, to hunt, I've seen people train dogs to go to the fridge, open it, and get them a drink. I guess that's a different kind of hunting. We've trained them to guide the blind. We've trained other animals that are are far more dangerous. Um, We've trained horses. they've They've trained pigs. They've trained mice, birds to talk and carry messages, gorillas, sign language, tigers, even house cats. It's true. I've seen it. All of these dangerous animals, while still wild and dangerous, have somehow managed to harness the nature of these beasts and to get them to do the will that we want them to do. Yet we get to verse 8, and what does it say? But no human being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. All these beasts, all these animals that we have, that we have harnessed, We've even harnessed the power of the wind to, uh, to run um, our livelihoods through, through wind power. And we've harnessed the power of the sun for solar power. Yet, the human cannot tame the tongue. This very thing that is connected to our own body, working in sync with our brain, we are completely unable to bridle. Why? Because James says it is a restless evil a dangerous poison. Clearly, it is more dangerous than any animal that is out there. And because of this, we must realize that it is truly impossible to tame it on our own accord. And you may be wondering, well, can't I just take a vow of silence? Can't I just stop using my tongue? You could. But James is not wanting us to take a vow of silence. And in fact, he says, it's much more dangerous than that because this is just half the story. The other half is that the heart, because the, the heart is the overflow, the words of the mouth are the overflow of the heart. There you go, I found it. Let me say that again. Because what is in the heart is going to come from your mouth. So no silence that you can take can affect what is in your heart. That is why we can't control it because our hearts are evil. So we go to verse 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. So as we seek to control our tongues on our own accord, we can't help but show our double-mindedness. We can't help but show what is in our hearts. James says we worship God. We bless him. We talk about him with lofty regard. We sit in church and we sing loudly, proclaiming his good works. But then the very people we are worshiping with, our brothers and sisters who have also been created in his image, we curse, we slander, we tear down. And this is where that fire begins to destroy. As we tear down our brothers and sisters, we are also then destroying the church and our witness. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 commands us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So I ask you, how can we walk in unity when we sin against each other with our words? Then outside the walls of the church, we as Christians have turned others away due to our hypocrisy. We leave church to go eat, and then we treat the servers, also image bearers of God, without the love of Christ, for things that sometimes aren't even 
in their control? And what does James say? This cannot be so. We have very often this year turned to 1 Peter 3. Um, I'm going to read a little bit before that. We're going to go to 1 Peter 3, 8. It says, we are called to be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate, and be humble. Then we come to the humble warning of verse 11 and 12. There's a spring pour forth from the same spring, both fresh and salt water. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. We need to examine ourselves. What is the status of our heart? How can we claim to bless God while cursing these image bearers? That is not uh, walking in love or compassion or humbleness. And what, one thing that I think so many of us, including myself, often forget that while we are sinning against people, ultimately we are sinning against God. Like a spring can't produce fresh salt water, likewise our hearts cannot put forth righteousness and haughtiness. If we claim to have the joy of the Lord dwelling inside us, then that joy must also overflow from our hearts. See, we cannot be a slave to sin and a servant to Christ. The two are incompatible. We must examine ourselves. Miss Dawn, could you come? So where does that leave us? We have a tongue that is small and powerful and that can control us. And when out of control, it will lay waste to all that is around us. And to further increase our predicament, we have no human way to tame it. No matter how we toil, no matter how hard we work, no matter how quiet we try to stay, there is never any hope to tame the beast of the tongue on our own. So as we continue to seek, like I said, we praise God in one breath, we call him Lord, we bless him with our mouths, then Another, we lay waste to everything around us, our relationships, our personal lives, and ultimately our souls. So now what? After all of this, I want to give encouragement. We have been sufficiently raked over the coals by James saying that there is no way that we can tame this tongue, that, that there is no way that we can uh, stop the tongue from, and our words from uh, burning down things around us. But God, as so often he does, gives us rest that we do not need to be perfect. Remember in verse 2, James says that we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone doesn't stumble in his speech, then he is perfect. We know that there is only one perfect man to have ever walked this earth. And he is the only one who had perfect control over his mouth and over his body. And that was Jesus. We know that all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. So that perfect man was sent here to save us, to redeem us, and to make us whole. And he is now an intermediary between us and the Father. So we don't have to work at this tirelessly on our own. As believers, we have the Spirit constantly working in us, sanctifying us, making us whole. And as we continue to give our lives over to Christ, our hearts begin to change. And shortly thereafter, our tongue follows. So let's not be discouraged as we go through this process. We will stumble. However, with Christ, we are no longer ruled by our tongues. James then goes on later in chapter 5, and he encourages us to pray, to confess our sins to one another that we may be healed, not just physically, but spiritually. So as we do stumble in our speech, we go to our brothers immediately and we, we ask for forgiveness. We confess our sins to them. We confess our sins to God. One thing that I have found it very helpful to pray is, is Psalm 51. We're going to read that. It's 
you want to turn there, Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Remember that out of our mouths flows the content of our heart. Pray that God will create in us a clean heart and renew that right spirit within me. And as God is renewing our hearts, our tongues will surely follow. Again, we cannot be perfect. So don't get discouraged when you lash out, when you respond to an issue in a manner that is sinful. We must keep seeking holiness, keep pursuing holiness. Charles Spurgeon puts this, beautifully, he says, I believe that the more holy a man becomes, the more he mourns the unholiness that remains in him. So as God is continuing to renew our hearts, we're going to be continue to be grieved by our sin. The more holy that we get, the more we mourn our unholiness, the more we continue to turn our hearts and minds to him. Surely we can't do this on our own. Romans says no one is good, not even one, and apart from him, we have nothing. But we have God, and he is a God who renews, who is making us righteous, who is there when we cry out to him asking for help. So today, I encourage you, let's examine ourselves. Let's examine our tongues and how we use them. More importantly, let's examine our hearts and the contents of them and ask him today for help, help to control our mouths, help to soften our hearts so that we can be a sweet aroma of Christ to others. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the conviction that it gives even when it hurts, God, because as we are convicted, as we are confronted with uh, ourselves, as we look into the, the mirror that is your word, we see uh, those things that, that need to be worked on. We th see those things that you are calling us out of. I pray, God, that, that we take it, that we use it, that we, we store it in our hearts so that as as we get to know you better, as we continue to read your word, we are becoming more and more like you, becoming more and more Christ-like, becoming more and more holy. I pray today that as we leave this building, that we are able to watch our tongues, watch the things that we say, and understand that we can't do all of that alone, that we need you above anything else, because you are the only one who truly changes the hearts of men. Pray that you guide us through the rest of this week, Lord, I pray that we store your word in our hearts, and 
go forth ready to meet again next Sunday. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I hope you have a good Sunday. It is always a blessing being with you. Have a good day.